Chris Oswald. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So listen, I want to welcome you to the finale luncheon of the 2019 National Conference and what an incredible conference it has been. It is my pleasure to be here representing UPS. Yes, what a wonderful, I'll take that. And it is my pleasure to be here representing UPS. And I want to thank you for those who are here for the Policy and Issues Forum and for that rousing discussion. The first ever for the NMSDC Annual Conference. I think you will agree it is so important to create a space to have real talk and real discussions about access and readiness and accountability and transparency. Uh, it, it is just critical to bring us together and I appreciate the NMSDC trying something new this year. So, yes. So for one last time today, I want to thank all of the co-chairs for helping make this possible and for being willing to embrace a conference that is trying a new schedule and new formatting and new content. So thanks to our corporate co-chairs and some awesome partners of mine from AT&T and the Coca-Cola company, from Delta Airlines and of course my very own UPS. Our, yes. And our MBE co-chairs, my goodness, Amcus and on way away, fantastic. Yes? And our Corporate Plus co-chair. If you didn't know VDART before, you know VDART now. Thank you, Sid and team. Yep. And the first ever government co-chair, which I think bringing private and public and MBEs together is so important. Thank you to the MBDA for their participation in this conference. All right. Now we're going to get right to it because we have a very special guest this afternoon. And I think you're going to be very glad that you are the ones that chose to stay for this piece. Because at the end of this conference, with our connections and our leads and our knowledge and our best practices and, and the urgency we have to engage, we need to be inspired for that next path forward. So today you're going to hear from Steve Pemberton. His life and success add up to a textbook for all of us to observe and learn more. But before you meet Steve, you need to know two things. One you're going to have a chance to ask questions after he's talked. And two, I can't do an introduction as the, the justice that it deserves. So we're going to see a little video to introduce Steve. Enjoy. The vision that I had of the adaptation of the book. A universal story about family and faith and fortitude and forgiveness and overcoming that is just that. It's universal. You need to see a chance in the world to be reminded, one, that all is not lost. The second is that there is still goodness in the land, that we are still fundamentally good people. And the third is that no matter what you've inherited, no matter what bad decisions you've made, no matter what challenges you're facing, new beginnings are possible. You can take all of these lessons, all of that struggle, and you can build something new, but not just for you, but for generations still to come. Isn't that magical? Ladies and gentlemen, meet the man who defied seemingly insurmountable odds to become a trailblazing corporate executive, enlightened diversity leader, visionary youth advocate, and acclaimed speaker. The man who inspires us to believe in our dreams, rise above obstacles, create opportunities for others, and most of all, persevere. The author of A Chance in the World, please welcome Steve Pemberton. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know it's a big room and we're a little bit spread out, but uh, thank you for the uh, brief uh, introduction. And uh, to, uh, to UPS, I should uh, uh, tell you at the very uh, outset that uh, when I was asked to uh, join you for the luncheon, uh, I said yes immediately and in part because um, I've done a lot of work with MSCC over the years, uh, but in particular, I uh, later on today have an opportunity 
uh, to go to Morehouse, uh, where my son is a freshman. Uh, and um, yes. And so, um, you know, I learned uh, you know, a couple of years ago uh, that there's a lot of secrets to re raising a teenager. Uh, and one of them is uh, don't let your teenager know that you know as much about technology as you actually do. And so, so Quinn does not know that because of social apps, I kind of know where he is, right? There's fine friends and there's Life360, so I kind of, you know, I can, without him knowing, I know where he is. So the number of times I have called that boy and I have said, uh, so hey man, what, what are you doing? And he, and he says, uh, uh, he's studying economics, he plays basketball, and I told him when he headed off, I said, look, you know, you're going to study economics, play basketball, and in that order. Uh, so there's times I check in on him, how you doing? And he says, uh, I'm at the library, and I'm looking at that app, and I'm going, no, you're not. You're over at Spelman. <laughs> so if you bump into Quinn Pemberton, don't tell him uh, that we know where he is. Mom and I want to kind of keep that secret to ourselves. Uh, I do want to say that, um, you know, generally speaking, I think never has the issue of supply diversity uh, been more important than it is uh, today that was reflecting some of the comments that you had on the, on the panel. Uh, and I want to share with you why that's important and not uh, simply from a professional context. I've been a small business owner. Uh, I have led supplier diversity efforts for multinational uh, corporations, including uh, Walgreens, where we saw record levels of, of growth, um, uh, and not only as a former candidate for the United States Senate, uh, and not only as an author, that's all the things that I've done uh, you know, professionally, but also personally too. Uh, what you saw in the video uh, literally was uh, the beginning of a, of a trailer about a movie uh, that had been done on my early years, growing up in a community of New Bedford, uh, which I smiled hearing all the conversation about Frederick Douglass earlier because New Bedford was the first place that he lived when he escaped from the South. It was a center of abolitionism, a stop on the Underground Railroad. So New Bedford is, is uh, really uh, important in that struggle for equality, access, and opportunity. Uh, and it was in that place that I would grow up actually in the foster care system. Uh, taken from my mother at the age of three because she was in the middle of a losing battle with alcoholism. Two years after that, I lost my father to gun violence and then off into the foster care system. I went because nobody knew quite what to do with me. And you know, and as uh, I magically uh, managed to get to college, when looking for my biological family, found them and learned that there was some broader things that had happened that had unfolded, these kind of systemic issues that had taken so much from me. Uh, and was so important for me to somehow try and take on this inherited circumstance and make it my responsibility. And some of those things I want to talk about. Uh, and it all centers around some of what we've been talking about here this morning, plus crystallizing this concept, this idea of the American dream. Ironically, you know, the American dream was not coined by the founding fathers. It's often assigned to them, but it didn't come from them. It actually came from a depression era writer. His name was James Trislow Adams. Uh, and he was the one who first coined the term and then went a bit further to define it. And he said, it's not a dream of motor cars and high wages nearly, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of that which they are innately capable and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. So that's how we defined the American dream. And then we kind of co-opted it to mean a house and a car and a white picket fence and uh, these kind of material things. But I think he was on to something when he defined it quite that way. And what it really was was an argument for more than anything else. You want to distill the American dream down to one word, it's about mobility. And that's what Trizel Adams was saying. This is about whether or not uh, you can do better. Uh, but regrettably, we're seeing the exact opposite of, of that today because the avenues of access are being narrowed or virtually uh, eliminated. Whether you're talking about access to higher education, access uh, to quality health care, access to capital to start or sustain a business, uh, lack of affordable housing, crumbling infrastructure. It's the unleashed this kind of income inequality that is virtually unprecedented in American history. You see any of the debates and you see this constantly being talked about, but there's something else not being talked about uh, that we're going to get to. But the reality is that now we are living very much in a world where your ability to be mobile is very much a reflection of what zip code uh, that you're actually born into. And it's no accident that it's also this extraordinary social toll 
uh, that income inequality is having. It's no accident that at the same time you're seeing this kind of income inequality, you're also seeing uh, record levels of suicide, record levels of addiction, record levels of gun violence, record levels of family separation, all of which I personally endured. And I can tell you it takes a lifetime to try and get that back, some semblance of normalcy. And that is happening uh, all across America today. And I don't see a lot of people talking about it, not with the candor that they should be. And they damn sure weren't talking about it last night, I can assure you. And it's not new, uh, unfortunately. Um, you know, this is actually the third rendition of income inequality that we've seen. We saw it in the 1890s, it was called the Gilded Age, and then again in the 1920s. Uh, and each time, America, you know, corrected. So optimism says that we're gonna do it again. This is how we we'll, would we'll just, in essence, kind of reset the table. Um, and the optimist in us should say that that's the path out of this, this quagmire. And I think that has to be true because if it isn't, then you know, future generations are going to be reading about the America in which many of us believed in and grew up in as this kind of ancient oddity, no relevance, no connection uh, to us. But the policies that lifted us out of that income inequality were significant, substantial. A lot of times they were driven by uh, massive strikes. The Gilded Age was not anything other than uh, a criticism of how we were living at the time, very similar now. Gilded meant covered, didn't mean golden. It wasn't something that you actually celebrated. It was hiding something that was happening. So in the 1890s there were these massive strikes, uh, the worst labor strikes we've actually ever seen in our country's history. And that drove uh, Labor Day and then a series of re uh, reforms, uh, increased uh, workplace uh, safety, health and access, education, and we created an income tax. Uh, women actually got the right to vote. And then in the 1920s, when income inequality reared its head again, uh, so much so that it created the Great Depression and all the social programs that so many of us know and heard so much about was again how society uh, uh, corrected. So this was this kind of resetting of the table about mobility uh, and access. Uh, and much of the, uh, the conversation, particularly on the Democratic debate stage, has a lot to do with that conversation, kind of resetting the table. And you see that in some of the policies and programs that are being debated, wealth tax, universal basic income, dividends. And those are, are all important conversations, and they should actually give us reason to believe. But here's the catch. And this unfolded in the 1890s and again in the 1920s, that the rising tide of those reforms did not find their way to black and brown communities. And so my antenna is up for all of the reforms that I hear about, and I am amazed at actually how very few of them talk about the impact that it's having on communities like mine uh, of New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, thrust into the middle of the circumstance uh, that, that I was in. So what's past is often prologue. And if we're not asking hard questions about those who propose reforms, and just how much further they are going to go to address these issues, uh, then all of the things that uh, benefited us as a nation will not address the income inequality that is disproportionately affecting uh, black and brown communities. And we're specifically not talking, and again, you didn't hear any of this last night, uh, you didn't hear anybody talking uh, about the importance of economic inclusion. Uh, one of the corrections that has to happen uh, it was reflected in a, uh, in a parable of somebody well-intentioned goes to visit uh, an impoverished village um, and, you know, the Westerner says, well, give me your top three priorities. And the villager says, oh, that's easy. He actually begins laughing. He says, that's easy. Our top three priorities are water, water, and water. And I'd say the same thing. Our top three our priorities now are economic inclusion, economic inclusion, economic inclusion. Conversation has to begin there, and it had better end there because everything else is just words. Because we're in a time where the table's being reset, and not in a way that's going to affect a lot of the issues that we're seeing directly. And let me give you a couple of examples. Some of it's well-intentioned. The Business Roundtable made up of America's most influential CEOs, they represent nearly $7 trillion in revenue, said, hey, the role of business in ch uh, has, must change. So in August of this year, they kind of reset uh, the stage and said, we have to move away from shareholder primacy as a primary driver uh, and evolve that commitment to stakeholders, 
uh, including customers, employees, and communities. Uh, what they were saying was we're not going to make the mistake that they made in the past where robber barons kind of took the gold uh, and went home. And in a way, it kind of forces us down these different paths to say that Milton Friedman's idea that a business has no responsibility other than the shareholders has to be revisited. And, and consequently, there's another conversation uh, about the invisible hand, Adam Smith's definition of, of, of capitalism, where it comes from. Well, it's making an argument that the invisible hand has to be actually uh, more, more visible. And so I looked at the business roundtable and said, okay, great. You know, let's reset the table here. Well, how are you going to do that? And I was specifically looking to see whether or not they talked about uh, supply diversity. They didn't use the phrase, but they were getting at it um, when they said, we're dedicated to serving as good partners to other companies, large and small, that help us meet our missions. Dealing fairly and ethically with our supplies is how they define that. Um, that has to be reframed. Because the definition of what is fair and ethical to one, as we're learning in today's climate, is different for others. So that needs to be repurposed to say, dealing equitably with our suppliers, whoever and wherever they are. So the business roundtable is made up of 10 committees from corporate governance to technology, uh, but there needs to be another, and that is focused specifically on community revi revitalization. So if they're gonna live up to that new proclamation, then it's gotta be reflected in the actual structures uh, that they create. And many of our elected officials in Washington need to redefine the way in which they're talking about inclusion too, not simply in the context of representation. Because coming off of a, of, a, of, a, of a Senate campaign, I can tell you that representation in and of itself is not sufficient. It's a part of it, but that's not all that it is. Uh, the way I would describe it is that you can be focused on representation means that you can still be in the room where it happens, but not at the table where it is decided. And there's a long walk in between those two things. And we have to start challenging conventional mindsets. Uh, coming off a campaign where, to be quite candid with you, I watched minority and women-owned businesses that I made part of my campaign and watched them be forced off of my campaign by folks who, at first glance, I thought would have been my kinfolk. But as we say where I'm from, all skin folk ain't kinfolk. So we're going to have to hold some folks accountable for the things that they say about inclusion and the behaviors and whether or not those actually match up. Otherwise, we're going to be having this conversation again. I could best crystallize this for you in a couple of examples. Uh, I love the movie, The Tuskegee Airmen. Watch it on occasion because I'm a student of history and what's past is prologue. A very powerful exchange that happens between uh, one of the Tuskegee Airmen, actually the captain played by Andre Brower, and he's sitting in front of a Senate committee, and they want to, in, in essence, disband the Tuskegee Airmen. And he's making this argument that, no, they just want the chance. They just want the opportunity. And there's this combative back and forth. And the captain of the Tuskegee Airmen says, are we to be Americans only when the mood suits you? A fair and impartial opportunity is all we ask, something that you yourselves would certainly demand. Now that's a movie, but that actually played out in real life right at the start of what was the nation's first Civil Rights Act. This congressman's name was Robert Elliott, he's from South Carolina. Uh, and he uh, was one of our nation's first congressmen. And he was an unrelenting and unapologetic advocate about access. And he describes walking onto the floor uh, of Congress. And since nobody knew who he was until he was there, there were three of them in the room. Uh, two of the three uh, were of my complexion and therefore their identity was not immediately discernible. In other words, the other congressman did not know that the other two were black. But as soon as they saw Robert Elliott, who was of a darker hue, they knew exactly who he was. And he rises on the floor of Congress and he is making this passionate argument for equity. And uprises the opposition and says to him, in essence, the only reason you care about this 
the only reason you care about it is because you're black. And what he said in response is so instructive, so necessary in this time. And so much progress is being purposely rolled back. And he said in response, I regret, sirs, that the dark hue of my skin may lend color to the imputation that I am controlled by motives personal to myself in this great measure of national justice. Sirs, the motive that impels me is restricted by no such narrow boundary as a complexion of my skin. I advocate it because it is right. That's the charge in front of us. For those of us who have been small business owners or are tasked with those responsibilities within organizations, we're not seeking a lower bar, just a ladder to opportunity. And we've proven time and time again what happens when you get that chance. I will, as I always have, continue to support the great work out of MSDC. I told Adrian backstage to have a forum that specifically focus on policies and issues. The result of this room is going to be reflected in what unfolds in the next decades, economic inclusion, economic inclusion, economic inclusion. Thank you, and have a great conference. Thank you. Uh, they tell me that uh, I have uh, a few moments to answer some questions. I did not talk a lot as a young boy, uh, as what happens when society doesn't see you. Uh, so I've been making up for it ever since. Uh, I'm sure we have microphones here. Um, and if you want to come and shout, ask a question or two. If not, I will be around here just a little bit uh, later before I, I head off and go see uh, Quinn, who will be at Morehouse and not at Spelman, as I mentioned earlier. All right, I'm going to let you get back to your lunch. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you.